We left off chapter 10 with Saul, who's a disappointing king despite all his outward appearances. And at the outset of chapter 11, God instructs Samuel to anoint a new king. It's going to be one of Jesse's sons. Now, Jesse is the grandson of Ruth and Boaz, who we read about back in chapter 9. Samuel takes one look at Jesse's son Eliab, and he thinks this is the guy. He's got all the externals of a royal aura. But God says to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And of course, it ends up being the youngest son, the shepherd boy, David, whom God instructs Samuel to anoint as king. Now, King Saul at this point is still in the midst of his 42-year reign as Israel's king, but David quickly begins to show both his devotion to God and the way in which God's favor is upon him for his devotion to God. And one of the ways this really plays out is in David's military success. When no one from Saul's army is willing to face the giant Philistine Goliath, David steps out in faith and strikes him down with a well-flung stone from his sling. Down in the valley of Elah, David is a picture of trusting God despite the circumstances. He says to Goliath, you come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. For David, there's no contest here. It's not him against the giant. It's not him against Goliath. It's God against Goliath. And so this giant does not stand a chance. What we see in David here and other places is that David doesn't see things the way Saul does. There's a difference in character. And the differences between David and Saul go on to cause a lot of conflict. We find this in the chapter where Saul grows jealous of David and, and tries to kill him multiple times. But God preserves David's life through this all, and David even maintains a measure of loyalty to King Saul, even while he's fleeing for his life from the king. Once Saul does die by falling upon his own sword in battle, David is finally able to ascend to his role as king, which he had been anointed for as a shepherd boy years and years before. So now Israel becomes united under King David, David establishes Jerusalem as the new capital of the, whole, of the whole kingdom of Israel. And in establishing Jerusalem as the capital, he also thinks it would be a good thing to bring the Ark of God into Jerusalem. This seems like a good idea, but it takes a couple of tries. The first try seems to be done in a spirit of fanfare and victory, really for David and, and his accomplishments, rather than out of celebration and reverence for God. There's this difficult passage where somebody reaches out his hand to steady the Ark of God on the wagon, and God strikes him down dead at that moment. And that sort of puts a pause on this whole procession. And David, looking at the whole situation, asks, how can the Ark of the Lord ever come to me? That seems to be the attitude David was lacking before. The second time around, they bring the Ark into the city with fanfare and celebration for God. This is where we find that well-known moment where David is, is dancing so exuberantly for God that his wife becomes embarrassed and angry at him. So David is king, he's established Jerusalem as the capital city, and God's Ark is there in the city. And then David says, Here I am living in a house of cedar while the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is under a tent. That doesn't seem right to him, so he decides that he's going to build God a temple. But God says to David through the prophet Nathan that he's not going to be the one who's going to do it. And actually, God's word through Nathan goes even further than that. Nathan says, I declare to you that the Lord will build a house for you. So God turns this moment around on David. And God goes on to say, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. 
Now we can look at this comment about one of David's sons being the one who's going to build the house of God or, or the temple, and we can see it as pointing to Solomon, who ends up actually building God's temple. But it's clear in what God says about this, this house or this kingdom reigning forever that there's certainly more going on in God's words here. Christians find the answer in Jesus Christ. Jesus builds the house of God, which is the church. In 1 Peter in the New Testament, we have each member of the church described as a living stone, with Christ being the chief cornerstone. So in Peter's description, we find the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to David, that one of his sons is going to establish a house, which we understand to be the household of faith, a house in which he will reign forever. So chapter 11 in the story leaves us in a pretty good place with God's people, with David on the throne, with Jerusalem as the capital city, and with God's presence on the Ark of the Covenant in that city. But as we'll soon find out, David also makes some pretty serious mistakes. And to find that story, we'll have to turn to chapter 12.